the next thing I'd like to briefly talk to you about is about the art of translation itself and a little bit about those who were involved in the translation. Um, how did it come about? Who did it? Um, who's responsible? Uh, back in the 16th century, uh, the Dutch humanist and theologian Erasmus, he put out a popular rhetorical guide and uh, it was entitled De Duplici Copia Verborum Acrerorum. And he took in that guide a simple Latin sentence for his students. Tue lettere me maniopere delectarum. Your letter has delighted me much. And he went on showing his students how that one sentence in Latin could be translated almost a hundred different ways. Thus, he amply demonstrated to them and to us there's absolutely no translation that will completely satisfy everybody. And I think we have to say that from the beginning. So most of, most of us will really like the new translation, but every one of us will find something in it we don't like. And that's just part of what the reality is all about. There will never be 100% approval of everything but with the new translation, we are definitely moving 100% forward. It also helps, before we look at the translation, to understand the importance of liturgical language for the faith of the church. The well-known axiom, lex orandi, lex credendi, the law of praying, the law of believing, uh, expresses, reminds us, that what we pray in the liturgy is not only the expression of our own sentiment, our own feeling, our own conviction, or even our own reverence toward God. But what we pray in the liturgy speaks to us, articulates for us the faith of the whole church for all ages. And so the words of the liturgy are not simply the expression of one individual in one place at one particular point of history. Rather, they pass on the faith of the church from one generation to the next. If I might make an aside, uh, some people may not realize this, but the most important catechetical instrument that the church has for passing on the faith is the Roman Missal. That's where our faith is nourished. That's where we learn the faith, just as much or even more so than we do in the Catechism. And because the Missal is so important for expressing the life of the faith and also passing it on, uh, the bishops have taken rather seriously uh, their responsibility to provide translations that are both accurate and inspiring. Have any of you watched some of those discussions of the bishops on EW2N? Any of you watched some of the bishops' conferences? I don't know anybody would watch it. It's bad enough going. <laughs> <laughs> but if you watch them, you'll see some of the uh, some of the strange debates, heated debates that took place over words and phrases at times. You know, and sometimes you will be you be you be you know just wondering what are these guys thinking about? You know. But the rather passionate discussion, I think, really shows that the bishops take that work rather seriously. And they were very careful. They had as their goal that they wanted a theologically accurate translation that the people would understand. And so uh, the hope is that with the new translation, we will have that language, which also has a dignity and beauty to it that befits the liturgy. Another thing about the translation, I, I find this very uh, helpful to understand the actual process and how it was accomplished. And I'll tell you why. About two years ago, I had Monsignor Sherman, who was the executive director of the Secretariat for the Bishop's Committee on Divine Worship, come to my diocese. And I said, there's better, no prophet is without honor except in his own country. So I said, you come and you talk to the priest about the, the uh, changes and all. And it was very well received, you know. I warned them ahead from whence the questions might come, and knowing the priest well, I guessed it right on target. And one, 
One priest raised his hand and said, I don't like the new translations. And uh, Monsignor Sherman said, well, Father, why don't you like them? He said, my parish was not consulted. <laughs> so what do you say to that? You know? So uh, I'd like to explain the actual process of consultation so you see how much the liturgy, which is the work of the whole church, is truly the work of the whole church, even in translation. Okay. Who is responsible for the translation, and how is it actually done? Uh, well, the ones responsible for the translation, as your bishop mentioned, is the International Commission on English in the Liturgy, ISIL. Uh, bishops back at the Second Vatican Council uh, set up this commission in Rome back in 1963. And more recently, in, in uh, September of 2003, the Congregation for Divine Worship kind of reorganized it and gave it the guiding principles. It's a mixed commission. Uh, that means it's bishops. There's 11 bishops on it. And there's some scholars that work with us on it. And we follow the uh, instruction of Liturgium Authenticum. The purpose of the commission is rather simple. It prepares the translations from the Latin, this international committee, and once those translations are prepared, then they're sent out to every Episcopal conference in the English-speaking world for their consultation. Uh, how does the actual translation work? Well, you get the Latin that's published by Rome, and when the Latin is given to ISIL, ISIL gave the Latin text out to no less, no less than nine teams of scholars to translate from the Latin a translation. And so you have the Latin, and then you have this first translation, which is called a base translation. And then uh, that text was uh, submitted uh, to... Uh, to the, uh, to the bishops, and they looked at it in terms of suitability, in terms of accuracy, and as a result of that, and working from those comments with those scholars, another text was, was proposed. So you have the Latin text, the base text, and then a proposed text. It was supposed to refine even more the work, the work that had been done. Then there was another hand in the pot, the Roman Missal Editorial Commission by a number of bishops, and they took those three texts, they looked at them, and they came up with another version of the same text. Uh, they examined it in terms of syntax, vocabulary, style, whether it's able to be understood uh, when it is said out loud, and they produced a new version, uh, which was called the Roman Editorial uh, Commission's uh, text. So after all that work was done, then the, the commissioners of ISIL would meet. And uh, being a member of ISIL, I enjoyed the work except for the fact that where we would meet. The head of ISIL, Bishop Arthur Roche from Leeds, England, had this strange idea that we should travel around the world to do the work. And that we should meet in all the countries that would be using this and invite people to come in and sit and work with us. And so we went to South Africa, we went to Mumbai, India. When we were going to India, I said, why don't we go to the Caribbean instead of India? It would be much more, but we traveled all over the world. And as a group of bishops, surrounded by people from those countries, we had in front of us, we had the Latin text, the base text, the proposed text, the Roman, uh, Roman Missal editorial text, and then we examined it as bishops. And we looked at it, and we, uh, we made our comments in terms of how it was translated, whether it was accurate, whether people would understand it. And then we produced a, 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 another text that eventually went to all the bishops in their conferences. When you do work like this, uh, you realize that many of us speak English, but we don't speak it the same. We don't speak it the same. If I get a little looser, I'll give you some of the funny examples in the question and answer. <laughs> okay. but, uh, our accents differ across the English-speaking world, but also our use of words differ. British athletes play in a team, we play on a team. We say gas, they say petrol. We take an elevator, they take a lift. What we call a stroller, they call a pram. 
In New Jersey and New York, we call our dad pop. I'm told in other parts of the country that's soda. <laughs> People's words, like their dresses, change. And judging from confirmations, our words are getting sh our dresses and our words are getting shorter and shorter. <laughs> What one individual would call a swamp years ago are now called wetlands. And I remember growing up, it wasn't a dirty word to say man or mankind, but today you can't could hardly use that word. And so we've substituted. Here's the Canadian bishops were very, very strong that we should never say man or mankind. It always had to be humankind. And in many cases that could work and we gain uh, an added inclusivity. But there are certain cases where only the word man would fit in order to, to regain some of the personalism and perhaps some of the references to Adam and to Christ as well. So uh, language changes and not only requires the expertise of people from many different countries, but it also requires, in addition to that expertise, a certain sense of humility, that sometimes we have to accept something that we might not be totally comfortable with. All right, so all that work was done the Commissioner of ISIL then put together all that work in a book. And uh, it was called the Green Book. Why? Because the cover was green. No other reason. <laughs> and they sent that Green Book out to all the conferences of bishops. England and Wales, Scotland, Ireland, the United States, India, all, all these conferences. Uh, there was a Green Book for the proper Mass, a Green Book for the proper seasons, one for ritual Masses. Then each national conference takes that green book and sends it out to the bishops. And then the bishops take that out and send it to the liturgical commissions. And the lady, the religious, the priest had a chance to, to comment it on a diocesan level, give it to their bishops, the bishops then took all that stuff and sent it to the bishops committee on divine worship. And I tell you, being the chairman of that committee, it was hell. <laughs> Sifting through these thousands of recommendations, Bishop so-and-so wants this word, this people wants that word, you know. Sometimes my Italian would come out and after looking at it, I'd go, eh, you know. <laughs> but anyway, we worked very hard as a commission, and we, we got all, all collated all the information, and then it went to the floor of the bishops, and there were those long, heated, heated debates that were absolutely ineffable. <laughs> Once the bishops would decide on the changes they want, that went right, right back to ISIL. And the commissioners on ISIL then took the comments on the Green Book from every national conference, collated them, tried to uh, take the best suggestions, put it all together, and with a final edition, which was called a Gray Book. <laughs> right? That goes out to the bishops, and the bishops vote on it, and you would think that would be the end of it, but it's not. Once each national conference voted on the gray books, and there were 13 of them all in all, they were finally passed in October of 2008, those gray books were then sent, uh, the final form was sent to the Holy See, to the Congregation for Divine Worship. And the Congregation for Divine Worship worked, and this is something people may continue to work collaboratively with ISIL. It wasn't like there were enemies working against you. There was always a dialogue between the congregation and the work of ISIL. And then they have this other group of bishops called Vox Clara that have their hand in it, and they advise the Holy See. Right now I feel a little schizophrenic because I'm on ISIL and Vox Clara, so sometimes I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but uh, Vox Clara experts would then uh, uh, advise the Holy See and the Holy See would then approve the final text. Now, I spent a little uh, time on that, uh, maybe more than you'd expect, but I wanted to make a point. It's been a very long, careful, collaborative, pastoral process in which the whole church has been involved. Not just bishops, not just scholars, but lady, religious, the, everybody's been involved in this work in some way. And it should be that way. Because the production of a liturgical uh, book is a work of immense importance. It deserves and should receive all the attention it was given.